So you're probably familiar with this Variety article by now. It came out about two weeks ago and went in depth about the struggles behind the scenes at Marvel Studios. The general reaction online was, the MCU is in shambles. I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but the MCU actually appears to be in shambles. It's, too, it's, so, it's in so many shambles. I never thought I would say this, but the MCU is in shambles. It's got all these shambles in, in it and around it. The MCU has never been more in shambles than it is right now. It's never been in more shambles than the shambles. It's than all the shambles that it has in right now. Oh, it's just so many shambles. From the Marvels suffering lengthy reshoots only to be the lowest earning MCU film ever, so far, to unethical levels of crunch on the VFX workers, and of course the domestic violence accusations against Jonathan Majors, who's supposed to be the big bad villain of like the next decade of films. With all of that, I guess you could say that the MCU is, in a word, um, it's in shambles, the MCU is in shambles. I think that's a fair way of, of putting it now with, with that context, sure. This report also claims that they are so desperate for money that Marvel is trying to reassemble the original Avengers actors to hopefully cash in on nostalgia from just a couple years ago. You can't say they don't respect the source material. Now, I find this article infuriating for a few reasons, but probably not the ones that you would expect. Like, people online have been ranting about how Variety clearly has an anti-Marvel bias with its reporting, but I would almost argue the exact opposite. Like, there are statements in here that really feel like they were secretly spun by Marvel PR to place the blame for their recent failures on the director of the Marvels and a single VFX supervisor who, in my opinion, both didn't do anything wrong. But they are women, so, you know, obviously that didn't take much for the internet to rally against them for that fact alone. And that's my main thing. There are so many nerdy channels out there who go through news articles like this with a lot of hatred and bigotry, especially when talking about a movie like The Marvels, if you can believe it. So yes, while I am so white that my uncle is literally Trader Joe, at the very least, I'm a queer person who doesn't hate women or people of color, and maybe you would like to hear my thoughts about this article instead of those other people for a change. Maybe even share this video. That'd be cool. So pop in your headphones and start folding your laundry as you listen to this very long video in the background because I have a lot of thoughts to say about this article. That's not me being snarky, by the way. I'm discussing a news article. There's not exactly gonna be a lot of fancy animations going on. The only thing I spent any time working on were the chapter cards, if you wanna just glance at one of those. Starting with part one, the Kang problem. Okay, thank you. Back to your laundry. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and for being such a big part of the title of this article, the situation with Jonathan Majors is hardly mentioned at all. But if you're not familiar, I'll summarize very quickly. So Jonathan Majors was cast to play Kang, who's supposed to be the uh, next big bad of the MCU a la Thanos. He's already been in Loki and the Ant-Man movie that I never watched, but I have no idea if he's in the Marvels, because I've not seen it. I've not seen the movie yet. Either way, he's already been set up in the MCU. But allegations came out accusing Majors of domestic violence, and now he's facing a very high profile trial, I think this month. This could be a video in itself, but suffice it to say, folks seem to be very split about this. And, you know, understandably so, since the trial, as of this recording, hasn't happened yet. And if you've seen my video about Ezra Miller's many crimes, you can probably guess that I'm conflicted about this one as well. A little less so, uh, considering the the texts that we can't, like, we can't get into this, but like, all right. So Jonathan Majors' lawyers released these texts thinking that they would make Majors look good. Um, uh, for me, they do the exact opposite. The texts are a little too long for me to read on camera, but I have them on screen for everyone who is not watching. You can pause now and read them. I also forgot to clarify that these are not texts from Jonathan Majors, but texts to Jonathan Majors from one of the people that he allegedly assaulted. It just feels toxic and manipulative, and again, we can't get into it. You see, my client may have hit and strangled his accuser to the point where she needed to be hospitalized, uh, but as you can see in these texts here, she admitted it's because she reached for his phone, uh, so it's her fault. 
think this case is closed. I don't know how well that would hold up in court. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? No, I definitely chose Dare. Now, the thing about Kang is that there are, like, infinite versions of him, so you could easily recast the character and say that he's one of the only variants that doesn't look like Jonathan Majors conveniently. But instead, this Variety article reports that Marvel is pivoting completely away from Kang. One insider said, quote, Marvel is truly fucked with the whole Kang angle, and they haven't had an opportunity to rewrite until very recently because of the WGA strike. But I don't see a path to how they move forward with him. They reportedly want to bring in Doctor Doom as the new big bad of the MCU instead of Kang, and hey, honestly, Doom's great. Doom's a great villain. I would love Doom to be like the next big bad. Uh, but the problem is, they haven't made any headway on a Fantastic Four movie in the many years since they announced it. Like, even right now, the current news is that Pedro Pascal will be Reed Richards, but even that's unconfirmed. Just like every other casting rumor that has happened in the past three years. And that brings us perfectly to... Part 2. Marvel Bloat. Hey, remember that big Disney Investor Day event back in 2020 that served only to make Bob Chapek look cool and competent and ideally bolster Disney stock prices amidst the pandemic? This is where Marvel's current struggle started, unsurprisingly. According to a recently released book about the history of the MCU called The Reign of Marvel Studios by Robinson, Gonzalez, and Edwards, folks like Kevin Feige and Kathleen Kennedy were pressured into announcing projects that were nowhere near ready. Uh, they were just logos with no actual plans behind them, which is even more obvious in hindsight since a good amount of them have been continuously overhauled, outright canceled, or at the very least delayed indefinitely, including Fantastic Four. Legend has it, they're still revealing logos to this day for projects that will never come out. We're excited to announce our new animated series, Baby Punisher, who little Frankie Castle hates nap time almost as much as he hates cops. And he hates cops. He's always hated cops. That's important to know about Punisher. I feel like people don't uh, understand that part. Drawn by Scotty Young. Admittedly, that was just wish fulfillment for me. If there was any actual plan during the pandemic, it was just to flood Disney Plus with as much content as possible. They had to rely heavily on the interconnected MCU to keep people coming back and watching the next show because, you know, it might tie into the next show, which might have a character that we'll see in the next movie. Marvel was basically directed to be relentless with new releases. This is when a lot of people, myself included, fell off of the MCU, not least of which because they only recently found out that each show should probably have a person who runs the show, like a showrunner, a thing that every other TV show has had to make sure that characters and storylines feel consistent across the season. So glad that they finally learned about those. It was a lot and it was sloppy. And I know that you don't have to watch every Marvel thing to understand the next Marvel thing, but that is an attitude that they themselves curated. Even Nia DaCosta, the director of The Marvels, said that the movie feels like a sequel to five things. Now, she tried to use that to her advantage by purposely leaning into the idea that the audience could be confused just as the characters are confused in the movie because they keep switching places with each other. I think that's a cool idea. How effectively that's pulled off? I don't know. I still haven't seen the movie since I was wearing that other outfit. I've not seen the movie yet. See? But while we're here, Part three, issues with the Marvels. If you're listening to this in the background, I put issues in quotes, just so you know. This part of the article is so infuriating to me, especially because it takes up one of the biggest chunks. By now, it's no secret that the Marvels is the lowest performing MCU film to date, and this Variety article came out before the film's debut, but, you know, the writing was on the wall. And the author blames this performance on reasons that are just so silly and don't touch on the actual problems. <laughs> Firstly, they blame it on reshoots. Now, reportedly, the Marvels has had four weeks of reshoots, and the author says that this is emblematic of uh, the script being incoherent and a tangled mess. Again, I've not seen the movie yet, so, you know, it might be a mess. I don't know. It wouldn't be the first Marvel movie that is. Here's the thing, though. Lengthy reshoots have been baked into all MCU films since, like, phase two 
over a decade ago. Again, we look at The Reign of Marvel Studios, a book whose authors have had impressive access to Marvel Studios productions over many years. And they write, quote, in Hollywood, significant reshoots are often a symptom of a troubled production. But at this point in the Marvel filmmaking process, weeks of reshoots were routinely built into the production schedule. They gave Feige a way to guarantee that individual MCU installments would fold easily into the larger saga. One insider even recalled that Kevin said, quote, we are writing this film until they rip it out of our hands, end quote. So sure, for other studios, absolutely. Four weeks of reshoots could be worrying, but for Marvel, I mean, this is just how this studio has been making movies for a while. So it feels weird to call out the Marvels specifically for this. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this is a good practice by any means. I think constantly rewriting and reshooting until the moment you physically can't anymore is likely part of why the VFX artists who work on these films are under so much crunch all of the time. And that sucks. And we'll talk about that a little later. My point here, though, is this is our first glimpse that the author of this Variety article may not understand how Marvel specifically makes movies. And I don't expect everyone to know everything, but you're a journalist. Heck, one of the authors of The Reign of Marvel Studios was quoted in this very Variety article by you. So you know that the book exists as a fount of knowledge that would be helpful for your article, and you're even in contact with one of the authors. But your reporting is in direct contrast to the Marvel scholars, effectively. It, it feels sloppy, but the next part makes me question if this author is even familiar with how anybody makes movies, because the second reason they give for why the Marvels is underperforming is so nonsensical, and I hate it so much. The author of this article starts throwing the Marvel's director, Nia DaCosta, under the bus. And if it was for a legitimate reason, then sure, you know, directors fuck up movies all the time. So what's the evidence here? I'll quote from the article. Eyebrows were raised once again when DaCosta began working on another film while The Marvels was still in post-production. The filmmaker moved to London earlier this year to begin prepping for her Tessa Thompson drama Hedda. A representative for DaCosta declined to comment. Yeah, of course they declined to comment because there's nothing to comment on. But it goes on. If you're directing a $250 million movie, it's kind of weird for the director to leave with a few months to go, says a source familiar with the production. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh... <sighs> it's not like DaCosta left during actual production. This article specifically says the film was in post-production when she left. Not only is it so common for directors to be working on different parts of the production process for multiple movies at the same time, but almost this exact circumstance has happened before with another director and it wasn't a big deal then! In 1993, Steven Spielberg was in Europe actively filming Schindler's List while Jurassic Park was in post-production. And just take the context of the time period here into account. Jurassic Park was pushing the boundaries of VFX at the time, and Spielberg was an ocean away on a different continent in 1993 when Zoom calls didn't exist. And yet, he was still able to simultaneously be involved in both films that went on to be wild successes critically and commercially. Why are we assuming that 30 years later, another director can't do the same thing? It would be easier to do the same thing today. There is nothing in here that said the post-production suffered at all from DaCosta being elsewhere. It is left up to the readers to speculate that it must be, because it sounds like it could derail things if you're not familiar with the film industry. And that, that's my main problem with this article, focusing on this specifically. I've already seen comments from people calling DaCosta unprofessional, and that studios should never work with her again. And I don't, necessarily blame the readers who are unfamiliar with the industry. I blame the author here for including these quotes 
and not looking into if it's a legitimate gripe. Like, I don't know, it's a little sneaky to me that the author isn't personally saying that this is a bad practice by DaCosta, but is instead quoting someone who worked on the Marvels. So there's deniability there, I guess, for the author. Like, oh, hey, I'm just reporting on what people said, which on the surface seems fair and balanced and good. But if you're a journalist, it's your job to investigate further, challenge your sources a bit. If they did, they'd realize there's no need for this in the article. Why is this here? I'm a long-winded person who doesn't like to cut things out of my scripts for videos. This video script is 1,500 words longer than the article I'm responding to. But what does this add to this article other than to villainize DaCosta for, again, doing something others have done in the past without issue? And this is the reason I'm not mentioning the author of the article by name. Please don't seek them out and harass them. I think they could have done better work, but I also know they're not the only writer who does this sort of thing. I'm only picking on this article because it went semi-viral with many other publications citing it. As a journalist, you have power. And Uncle Ben said it best when he told Peter Parker, with great power comes a huge swing and dong, but I don't get to use mine because your aunt just likes to peg me. At least that's what my sources told me, he said. It just sounds right to me, I didn't question it. Do you want to know why the Marvels had a bad opening weekend? In my opinion, it has nothing to do with the stuff the article mentioned and has everything to do with the stuff the article didn't mention. The stars of the film couldn't promote it during the actor strike that only ended like a day or two before the film came out. The typical promotional tour that actors go on for months at a time before a film premieres it just didn't happen. And even the minuscule amount of marketing that they were able to put out for this movie is not good. I mean, from what I hear, because I can't stress enough, I've not seen the movie yet. It's called The Marvels, but it's really a Miss Marvel film with Carol and Monica as supporting characters. And if that's true, wow, I have a much higher interest of seeing this film now because I love Kamala, but there is no marketing that led with that. It feels like it's being pitched more as a sequel to Captain Marvel and that's fine, but I can't not mention that uh, Captain Marvel was a film that famously rallied the internet's most annoying people against it. The Variety article doesn't mention that infamous part of the internet history, but I'd wager that's at least a factor. And this new movie has more women? Woman who not white? Would you believe that the annoying people are back at it again, complaining about that? Again, this article came out before the movie did, but... Quick on their feet, Variety also chased this initial article with another one about how the Marvels obviously had a bad opening weekend, still without ever mentioning either the strike or the weirdos who hate Brie Larson. However, I want to take a moment to spin this in another way. Is the Marvels the lowest opening weekend box office for the MCU? Yes, it's a franchise that measures success on if a film can make half a billion dollars at least. So of course it feels like a failure to them. But it's also the highest opening weekend box office for a black woman director at $110 million worldwide. And that's not making headlines. So I don't know. At the very least, the author of this article does point out that one of the bigger problems with the MCU right now is how Marvel Studios is stretched very, very thin. Especially, part four, VFX Crunch. So much like the Jonathan Majors situation, this could be a video in itself. But the article mentions the crunch put on the VFX workers, and so will I. If you didn't know, the Marvels was supposed to release before Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania, but they swapped release dates because apparently Quantumanium was further along in production. Unfortunately, that made the post-production time for Quantumania much tighter than it should have been for a movie that's almost entirely VFX. I mean, there were even entire headlines about how bad the VFX were in this movie, which I feel like is a first for a, a giant blockbuster like this. I think it's definitely first for the MCU. Quoting once again from the reign of Marvel Studios, quote, one VFX technician who worked on Quantumania recalled certain things were used to cover up incomplete work. Certain editorial cuts were made to not show as much action or effects as there could have been, likely because there just wasn't enough time to render everything. It really did feel like certain scenes were trimmed or otherwise altered to either save money, save time, or cover up the inability to get it done. They were squeezing blood out of stones. 
and we were all out of blood. To keep the stock prices up though, Disney felt they needed a scapegoat and found one in the studio's longtime VFX supervisor, Victoria Alonso. Now, something you have to understand about Disney is that they have an unwritten rule that they do not like to work with people who speak up publicly about grievances they have toward the mouse. Kevin Feige specifically has told employees to keep their head down and do the work. Kevin, no! You're supposed to be the one that people like! No. Oh. Especially in the VFX world at Marvel, Alonzo says it was a culture of, quote, the answer is always yes. It doesn't matter if there isn't enough time. Make time. Work while you eat. Cover your keyboard in dry instant ramen crumbs because it's inefficient to boil water. Raw dog that ramen. To my knowledge, Alonzo was never outspoken about the unethical treatment of VFX workers at Marvel, but there was at least one issue she couldn't stay silent on. She publicly criticized Bob Chapik for not taking a stronger stance against Florida's don't say gay bill. Pushing her luck further, Alonzo refused to act on Marvel Studios' request to remove pride symbols from Quantumania for foreign markets. This was likely the very first time the VFX department at Marvel Studios ever said no to anything. It was a big deal. Not that it mattered though, because you know they outsourced the VFX work anyway to remove the pride symbols and then promptly fired Alonzo. Disney claims that her firing had nothing to do with the VFX situation or the removal of pride symbols or anything like that. It had, it had nothing to do with that, all right? She breached her contract in a different way because she promoted a different movie uh, that wasn't from Marvel during the time. It's just, it was complicated and it has nothing to do with the things that people are mad about us about. And like, yeah, Technically, that's true, but it's hard not to take the context of all this into account. Heck, to this Variety article's credit, they even point this out as well. Quote, some internal sources suggest Alonzo was a scapegoat and point to the She-Hulk VFX issues as a symptom of a deeper rot, namely a lack of oversight on script development. The so-called bad VFX we see was because of half-baked scripts, said one person involved with She-Hulk. That is not Victoria. That is Kevin and even above Kevin. Those issues should be addressed in pre-production. Kevin, you did it again, man. Come on, get it together. And if you didn't know this, Victoria Alonso was a cornerstone of Marvel Studios alongside Kevin Feige, having worked on, I believe, every Marvel movie and TV show since the original Iron Man. Her being fired was massive news and showed that Disney wasn't above letting go of even their most senior creatives if they didn't keep their heads down and do the work. If morale for the VFX workers wasn't already abysmal, I imagine this would only make it worse. All at a time when the work never seems to stop and only grows more demanding. Now, I want to add here that VFX Crunch is sadly nothing new to Marvel films. One visual effects producer who worked on five MCU projects said, quote, I always think if you can finish a Marvel film two weeks before its release, you're doing pretty good. But yeah, it's stressful. Another said, quote, you see all these timelines for films and just think it won't ever stop. The workload becomes agonizing at times. These studios keep feeding from the same trough because the work is so abundant and Marvel needs so many people and artists need jobs. Where do you think these studios are going to go? But to be even more fair, Marvel is not the only perpetrator of VFX crunch. Last year, I interviewed a VFX artist about this very thing, and I got so busy I forgot to release this video anywhere. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but this is what they said at the end of the interview. On the record, you're saying uh, Marvel's the worst and you would never work with Disney <laughs> and, and anything like that ever again. Just want to get that really quick. I'm saying that any client, big or small, can be bad to work yeah. with. Any client, big or small, can be unreasonable and demand 
lots. Mm -hmm. It um, happens everywhere. It also happens yeah. with them. I'll post the full video to Nebula and Patreon for those of you who support me there. If you want to go check it out, it's incredibly insightful about the state of the industry. And they even shed light on the Batgirl film that Warner's Discovery shelved. Remember that one? Look, I always have like five or six videos in various stages of production, and then I forget to release them. I'm so sorry. All of that to say, I'm so glad to end this section of the video by being enthusiastically thankful for the news of VFX workers at Disney and Marvel moving to unionize. I feel like there have always been film critics and movie snobs that take issue with a seeming, you know, over-reliance of CGI these days, but I find most audiences truly don't care or really don't even notice if a VFX shot looks slightly off or unpolished. So if nothing else, never thought I'd say this, thank you Ant-Man and Wasp Quantumania, because Apparently, you were so bad, you showcased to everyone with eyes what happens when you push VFX workers too hard for too long. Look at you, unintentionally looking out for the actual little guys. Also to the author of this article, you put too many M's in Quantumania at this part. It's, it's not too late to change it, but I might be the only one who noticed, so. Part five, an unfortunate pattern. As I said at the start of this video, this article might come across as anti-MCU on the surface, but when you look into it, a pattern emerges. The Marvels is expected to underperform, but we have someone we can blame for that. The quality of VFX is noticeably getting worse, but we have someone we can blame for that. And I certainly don't want to fall into that same trap by implying this one author of this one variety article is solely to blame for spreading misinformation when the bigger problem is that there's a horde of folks online who are looking for any reason to hate women and people of color. But to their credit, the author of this article did at least cover how the VFX industry is busted right now. So maybe, it's not one person's fault, but put yourself in Disney's big, ridiculous shoes. It's easier to appease stockholders if you convince them that you only have to fire one or two people to fix everything instead of the messier truth, which is there are outside forces beyond our control, but even with what we can control, it's clear our whole operation needs to be restructured and recalibrated. It's a little messier. In that regard, Maybe Marvel is in shambles, but they've been in shambles this entire time. And that is more than okay to report on. I just wish that this article was a little more focused on what the actual issues are. Now, I've said this in the past, and I'll say it again. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with having bias when you're covering current events like this. I mean, I threw in a bunch of my own opinions throughout this video, and that's totally okay. But it is nice to know where certain outlets land on the political spectrum so that you can be informed about what you're reading and get that additional transparency and context. You know I love context. So, for example, for all of my critiques about this article, Variety is a publication that does have a slight left lean to it, which I think is actually part of why I'm so frustrated with this reporter. It feels sloppy and not very thoughtful, but at the very least it is better than some right-leaning publications that literally refer to the Marvels as female Marvel film. If you're curious, I got all of this information and more from today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News makes it easy to compare news sources, read between the lines of media bias, and break free of algorithms. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting. For example, let's look at this story on the Marvel's poor performance at the box office. Right away, you can see that the story was reported on by 126 news outlets. 25% of the reporting was left-leaning, and only 7% was right-leaning. You can also see the factuality and ownership trends. 58% of these news outlets were media conglomerates. You can also easily compare headlines and even get a breakdown of specific differences between left and right reporting. For example, right-leaning outlets tend to focus a lot more on Marvel's woke issues, on surprisingly. Now this sale by Ground News is their biggest of the year. And with it, your Ground News Vantage subscription will only be $5 a month and include unlimited access to their website, app, and newsletters. Also, here's a really cool feature that I discovered uh, on a whim because I just wondered if it would work, and it did. You can copy paste the URL of an article that you're reading directly into the search bar on Ground News, and it will hunt down that article for you so that you can compare it right there. Super quick. It's great. And yeah, you could dig through a couple dozen Wikipedia pages every time you want to read an article online, 
but you know, realistically, you're not going to, I'm not going to. It takes a lot of time and effort to do that when you just wanna read something. So ground news is a much better way to do it. It's simple, it's easy, and you'll actually use it, especially because you can have this information right in front of you with the ground news browser extension and the ground news app. And again, ground news is having a Black Friday sale going on right now for 40% off of your ground news vantage subscription, but only when you use my link, ground.news slash nerdsync. It'll be the very first link in the description. And again, you get unlimited access to their website, their app, and their newsletters. All for just $5 a month. The sale ends on November 30th, so head there quick. Once again, it's the first link in the description. What a good sponsor for today's video. Didn't plan it, just sort of worked out. Thank you so much for watching. Like I said, the interview that I did with the VFX artist last year is up right now on Patreon and Nebula for people who support me over on those platforms. It's such a huge help. I mean, you'll notice that I got my camera back. Some of you probably won't notice because I filmed my last video on my phone and you were like, I couldn't tell it was your phone. Um, which I don't, it feels like a compliment. I don't know. Either way, I got it fixed and it is squarely because of the wonderful nerds who support me over on Patreon and Nebula. So thank you so much. Here are their names floating across the screen if I have time to do that. Once again, my name is Scott reminding you to explore your favorite art through curiosity and vulnerability. See ya.